the final session, the final event of the summer school. So I just want to remind you where, where we got, where we started from, and what we expect to happen, right? Um, so um, there is 10 projects in the room. Uh, we explicitly, you know, when we were constructing these projects, uh, we wanted them there to be a part of the project, which is rather easy, so that you can do something uh, in a matter of a couple of weeks. And then there were explicitly open-ended problems where we don't know what the solution is. And in some cases, we have an idea, but in many cases, we just don't even have an idea of what the result's going to be. And with any re as with any research projects, some of you got luckier than others. Um, so you managed to, do some, to make some progress, maybe not because you are smarter, but simply because you got a project which actually has a solution, right? And then uh, some others may not have that solution, and that's OK, right? Um, I know, I mean, I interacted with four or five different teams that some of the teams made some progress, which I think is potentially, if you keep on working at the same rate, which I don't expect you to, but if you keep on working at the same rate, then maybe within half a year or something, that can come into a paper. Uh, but, uh, but some others have not made that much project, right? Um, uh, that, that much progress. Uh, again, the thing which I want to remind you all is that uh, when we asked you to separate yourself into groups, we explicitly requested, if not demanded, uh, that you go to a group and work on the project that you know nothing about, right? That you, you were not al allowed to work on the project which your advisor has uh, cooked up or something like that. And the idea there is that you would have to read a bunch of papers, you would have to learn. Um, so even if you do not succeed in providing a publishable result at the end, you actually have learned something, and that's the result, the main result of the project, right? Um, and it also means that uh, for some of you who, let's say, work on uh, dissipation in your daily life, uh, the results that people who are working on dissipation now in this project produced might seem trivial, but you should not laugh because they started with nothing, right? So what they produced in two weeks is, 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 is they started from zero and they managed to produce something. Okay. So that's where we started. This is where we are. Uh, this is all going to be recorded. It's been recorded at the request of Alex and Thierry, who have put in a lot of effort in these projects. And they cannot be here, and they want to see uh, how you all perform. Uh, so it's going to be recorded. It's going to be put online. You will be able to see yourself in posterity, so no swear words or anything like that, right? Um, finally, uh, this is how we're going to run it. Uh, you have 12 minutes, you are requested, every single person in your group has to say some words, right? has to present at least some slides, so 12 minutes, everybody has to show up. Then we have uh, about five minutes for questions, uh, and then there's a change over time for the next team, right? It's 20 minutes, you should not go over 20 minutes. Hopefully, it's going to be less than that. Uh, we will um, put an alarm and at 12 minutes you will get a ring, at 17 minutes you will get yet another ring, and at 20 minutes uh, I am not as tough as Alex, but I will try to block you off, okay? Um, so we're going to do five of these presentations. Uh, hopefully it's going to take about an hour and a half instead of an hour and 40 minutes, which is if you multiply 20 by 5. Then we're going to have a break, and then we're going to come back for the other five presentations, uh, and then after that we're going to say goodbye. So that's about it. Anything else I should add? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Let me see something. All right, so before, since everybody's paying attention now, <laughs> and some people are going to evaporate, uh, I just want to take the opportunity. Uh, this is the first time that I've ever been able to organize this particular physics school. And the work of Leo and everyone in, in Boulder as well as the funding from the NSF. And, and for you guys, it's been really kind of an amazing experience for me. So thank you, everyone, for, for all of the organization and your energy for the, for the course. Thank you. All right, now. Actually uploaded their slides yesterday. 
I'm also turning off my Wi-Fi so you can't upload any slides now. In case you were trying. Ah, well. uh, this helps us wait a minute. When the so, so, okay, so the way we're going to do this is if anybody's been to APS March meeting, uh, yeah. then we're going to run it, or I'm going to run an APS strip. Okay. So 12 minutes, no questions, I'll stand up, and then there's five minutes for questions. If that bleeds over, Ilya will start beating on heads. Okay. So group six can come on up. Yeah, let's do projector in the middle. It's probably better. You want the middle projector? Yeah. What's the uh, what's the chord for the middle one? Oh yeah. All right. We will need microphone so that we can see chords. Yeah. Just hold it. I don't think I need to point. I, or I'll just actually point. How do you pass the slides? Oh, yeah, so how do we flick the slides? Yeah, gotcha. Let me. How does it work? I guess you just press the button. Okay, we'll know once it happens. There is a, a battery warning, I guess. Is that okay? We'll find out. Oh, you want full screen? Yeah. It's also playing on that, okay. You have a battery here? Yeah, it's kind of running out. Yeah. 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 Ah! Oops! <laughs> <laughs> I do! I think it's yeah, there, down there. Yes, yes, I'm getting there. You're ruining the surprise. <laughs> okay. I think that should work. Okay, we're starting. You timing? Am I timing? Okay, so uh, I get the honor of starting, and I guess it's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're Project Group 6, uh, Temporal Synergy and Cellular Signaling. Uh, Isabella, Lakshmi, me, Liam, Rotio, and Sanghyun. So I'm going to start by introducing cell signaling, and then we'll describe what temporal synergy means, and then what we've actually done. So cells utilize uh, cascades of biochemical networks to translate environmental information into intracellular responses. So at a very coarse overview, we've inputs like osmotic stress, signaling molecules, food, and cells output things which we can measure, such as behavior, uh, gene regulation, or chemical modifications. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a paper that uh, Andrew Mugler was involved in, uh, and kind of forms the, well, at least part of the motivation for the project. So as a quick overview, consider uh, a microfluidic device and there we have fibroblast cells, an ensemble of them, maybe two and a half thousand. And we expose them to four discrete levels of ATP, an external uh, signaling molecule. And in response, these fibroblast cells uh, experience some calcium dynamics. So what happens is basically they bind to a receptor, it creates a second signaling molecule, the signaling molecule opens some ion pathways, and we get these rich calcium dynamics. 
Now, the question is, how should a cell sample its own temporal profiles? Right? So, somehow we know that signaling molecules have very rich dynamics, and we want to see you know, how a cell should sample its own temporal profiles, or how this information is encoded. So, just as a quick schematic here, we have, uh, basically, we're measuring the fluorescence. The calcium has some fluorescent tag. And we have four discrete concentrations, and these colored bars are the, the average uh, fluorescence intensity over time. So when I stop talking, I just want you to think about cells, uh, some external signal, and the response of the cell, and how you can quantify that. And I'll pass over. So to quantify the information and code by calcium dynamic, we should, defi we should define the scalar mutual information and the vectorial mutual information. The scalar mutual information is defined as the difference between the unconditioned entropy at the time t uh, for all the ATP concentration and the, the average of the of the differential in, in the of the differential entropy uh, conditioned at each. ATP concentration. The vectorial, the vectorial mutual information considers the vector of time in which we must define the sampling start time that it's equal the time t in the scalar mutual information. We should define also the, the sampling duration and the sampling rate. In these figures, you can see the scalar mutual information in black. That is the same for the all of them. And in each column, you can see the dif for different uh, sampling duration. Um, as you can see, the mutual information increase when you increase the measurement you take in the same sampling duration. But if you divide the mutual information by the number of samples, the scalar mutual information is, la is largest. We can also show the mutual information depending on the memory capacity, that is the length of the time vector. You can see that the mutual information increase with the number of, of measurement we have. And the, um, the sampling start time is only relevant for a small, a small vector of time. Now we should define the redundant mutual information as the difference between the, um, between the, the sum of the scalar mutual information values taken individually at each time and the vectorial mutual information. And you can see the, this parameter is always positive. That means that there will always be a um, non-negative amount of, of mutual information, of redundant mutual information between the, at the output at one point and the output at another point. So yeah, now we've established that there's redundancy in measurements. Um, but synergy exists. So what's synergy? Um, synergy implies the exact opposite of what redundancy in measurements does. So synergy basically means that if you have two spikes, um, the information that you get from considering both spikes together is always going to be more than um, the information you get from the two separate spikes summed. So um, if you see the diagram here, we have a time series. And uh, T1 and T2 are like two different events. So basically, the mutual information that you'd get by considering both events separately, and if you add them, is still going to be lesser than uh, the information you'd get by considering the two events to be a compound event. And um, so this was actually studied by Nama Brenner and her group. Uh, and it was also observed in um, uh, the neuron of the blue fly. So that's how um, neurons seem to code information. And so this basically helped formulate what question we had to answer. So can we cook up a model in cell signaling that shows temporal synergy, where the whole output trace is more informative than the sum of the measurements? And um, now, Isabella will tell you how we went about answering this question. OK, so what you just heard is that basically we want to have a system where you get more information from a temporal sequence than from individual measurements. And so our, our idea was basically that this can happen if you have long-range temporal correlations, because such correlations you can only get from a time trace, but not from individual measurements. So the first thing we looked at is really a non-Markovian system where the next step depends on the whole history of the process. And more concretely, what we looked at is a system that you could imagine kind of as a receptor system. So if you had two signaling molecules, one Y, which is external, 
and one X, which is internal, and only if both of them are bound, you expect to get a signal, so a spike. So what we look at is really a vector of spikes, so always a spike, no spike, 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 whatever, so ones and zeros. And um, we assume that the firing probability at the next time depends on the whole history of the process. And in the following sense, so you always have a spontaneous firing rate, but then you also have an induced rate. And this induced rate depends on this f of y, where this y is determined by the input you get to the system. And then you have this complicated looking term, which is not so important in detail, but basically the, question, uh, the idea is that it depends on the sum of all the entries of the vector before. So it's really a non-Markovian process where you need the whole history of the process. And the idea is how you could implement this molecularly is that you could have a positive feedback for the x. So say y and x were bound, then you get a spike, and then you assume that each spike produces a new x. So then per spike you get a new x. The more x you have, the more spikes you get, the more x and so on. So you have like this positive feedback where this sum of all the spikes is really the concentration of the x at the time. And now, do we get synergy in the system? I guess if we wouldn't, I wouldn't show you <laughs> this model. And um, so, yes, we do. Um, and actually, um, so we look at the system now for two inputs, 0 and 1. And in this case, this f of y is just 0, 0 0.5. And maybe for the moment, just ignore the colors. Then you can see the synergy versus the number of measurements. And indeed, you can see that in all the cases for different parameters, it's always positive. So it tells you that you don't have redundant information, but rather you have synergy in the system. And now if you look at the different colors, this actually encodes different memory. And I, I cheated a bit before because I told you that we just look at the sum of all the spikes. Actually, we introduce a memory, and the memory tells you how far you con can go back in the past and basically count how many spikes you had during the last m steps. And what you can see is that in this case, for higher memory, your synergy increases, and this is just because you get more information on the temporal correlations. Now, in the other case, it's a bit more complicated. You can see that for small numbers of measurements, actually it increases. But then for higher number of measurements, actually for higher memory, it decreases. And we believe that this is due to the case that, in this case, this is kind of this complicated probability that it depends on the x. And this saturates very quickly. So soon, you actually reach a steady state where you only spike all the time. And then you just kind of get more information because you're kind of in a steady state. And now you could say, OK, this is really nice, but um, why should the cell measure this non-Markovian thing and not just instead measure the x? So you could ask the question, how does the synergy change when we measure x directly? So now, uh, instead of uh, measuring the each occurrence of x, now we measure the, the total number of x at current, uh, current time. So uh, the maturing uh, the factorial material information is now the cumulative sum of the previous one. And as you can see here, we have positive synergy. Uh, for, uh, we, uh, on the right is the non-Markovian case with the same parameter for comparison. So the reason why we still have a positive synergy, even though we are not keeping track of the history, is that the probability that x binds at the uh, next time step depends on the current uh, number of x. Uh, we, in other words, we still have a feedback in our system. In terms of learning, the cell, uh, by having the vectorial mature information, the cell can learn that the each increment of x is either uh, 0 or 1, which it, cannot, uh, it can never learn by having a scalar mutual information at uh, arbitrary time points. And we tried other models, such as the negative feedback or other non-Markovian models with different uh, feedback functions. And as you can see here, for all of them, uh, we have positive synergy, uh, with, uh, at least for finite number of measurements. So this, this tells us that regardless of whether uh, the system is Markovian or non-Markovian, or regardless of the uh, specific function of the feedback, we can still have synergy uh, as long as we have feedback in our system. Okay, so uh, we have questions, and if you don't have questions, um, we can talk about what else we would have done if we had more time or ability.
that. Yeah, I mean, so the effect, it depends on the memory of your own system, right? So, and at, yeah, so at some point as well, I mean, the information will naturally be bounded by the minimum of the entropies of the input and the output. So, like, there isn't a theoretical maximum of information because we're using discrete systems. Maybe with a, a continuous input, we could investigate that further, but yeah, it, it will become redundant. I kind of expected the uh, Markovian case to be the same as the non-Markovian case if the memory were zero or one, however you're counting it, but it, is that not true? It didn't look true. So I think um, you're right in a sense if you have a memory of one, also the other case with the SIs is Markovian because it only depends on the, in on the state now. But the process changes because so if you have like only the last memory, you only have a zero or one. But now if you have a longer, l like the X, then you can sum up to basically infinitely many spikes. So it, it's right, I think, that it gets Markovian if you have m w equal to one. So also on the non-Markovian side, there was this memory is equal to one, which would correspond to a Markovian case. And there you can also actually see like positive synergy. But the process is, I think, different. <laughs> so I was just curious if you could tell us a little bit about conditions. What kind? When would you want to use a synergistic code versus a redundant code? What, what kind of conditions should there be? What kind of conditions? So basically, if you, okay, it depends on the dynamics. I mean, it depends on the dynamics, right? So and the ability of, in this case, the cell to like actually remember or integrate information over time. So the general principle is that even if you have redundant information, there I you can still actually get more information by considering uh, a vector, but just not more information per symbol, basically. So in general, you could argue that uh, you, know, you should always use a vectorial information unless there is some sort of uh, you know, physiological limit to the amount of time that you can remember for. And it becomes really important for cases like, you know, this where we had some memory effect where the output is actually a function of the current state. So there is actually extra information to be had on this time point. And really we can't say more than that. Like, it really depends on the dynamics. We can't really make any very general claims. So I have maybe an add-on because so I, so I think that it's bi a bit difficult to distinguish between synergy and redundancy because I think in principle you can have both and it's a matter of how large they are each and basically I think if you get a positive or negative one is kind of the synergy minus the redundant information. So I think it's like it's also in our case a trade-off of kind of having redundant information because the X gets similar or they are always close if they are neighboring. But at the same time, um, you have this feedback, and that's why you get more information, kind of. Uh, so, um, what, are the <laughs> <laughs> sure. what are the conditions on how the stimulus should change so that the, that the synergy is actually there? Maybe the, the other time scales, if it changes too fast or too slow, that you will not get synergy. And, and actually, how much total information is there? And if you go to many, many measurements to actually recover all of it. Okay. Yeah, do, do one of you want to answer, or will I continue? Um, okay, so, um, I don't know where to start. <laughs> um, I guess with our inputs, it was different. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the inputs that we're using are, I, I mean, this is really a toy model, you know, so um, we were using generally binary inputs and binary outputs. You will eventually recover all the information in our model cases, and I presume that in an actual like living system that things will just change over this amount of time. I don't think you really expect things to remain stationary for long enough to recover all the information. Um, and was there another part to the question? So I think you had a question about time scales. So I think in our case the input is really constant. So it's it's a long the input concentration is fixed, and over the time it doesn't change. And we haven't tried out what happens if you change it.
Who wants to be the She's microphone? Starting. You're starting? I, I start, but um, <laughs> is it connected to the internet? What's that? Is your computer connected to the internet? Uh, no. No. So we have a, a link that comes in. Oh, you want me to choose? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, it then uh, gives yeah, people an option to upload the last one. Yeah, I think it's true. Hey guys, uh, so we are the Salamander Group, as should be clear. Um, so uh, we were dealing with uh, sort of in accordance, uh, following what Stephanie presented um, with the responses that neurons have to stimuli. So we were specifically looking at the uh, retinal ganglion neurons, retinal ganglion cells from tiger salamanders and how they respond to uh, natural stimuli. So in our lectures we saw sort of like one dimensional lab cases where you have these arrays of, of uh, neurons responding to like a 1D bar moving across the screen. But that's not really biologically relevant, right? The salamander is going to be looking at uh, a natural environment with like a lot of you know, other objects moving around, complex high dimensional stuff. So uh, our project was to take one of these sort of natural scene stimuli and ask two questions. The first is, is it possible to quantify mutual information between the stimulus, so this natural scene, and the neuronal response? And two, is mutual information a useful tool uh, in determining what the salamander sort of cares about? Um, so we had two sort of sets of given data. One was the stimulus, which is a video of a natural scene, which we'll show you in a bit. And the second was electrophysiological data from uh, retinal neuron cells. Um, so how do we get this data? So uh, just briefly, you start with a salamander, you pop out his eye, you take out the retina, <laughs> you mount it on an electrode array, and then you can get uh, signals from each individual neuron in theory. Um, and then you present this array with uh, the video of the visual stimulus. Um, and you do this about 300 times or how many times you need to get sort of replicable results. So uh, how do we, or wh what is the, the stimulus, you might ask? Well, <laughs> just briefly, this is what a, a salamander is going to be looking at. And listening to. <laughs> right, so really naturally what the salamander is going to be, uh, you know, interacting with. Uh, <laughs> And uh, what you get from this uh, are neuron spikes per time for every time you've run the, the stimulus. Uh, and so if you, this is an example of sort of one uh, run, and depending on how you bin the data, you end up getting a binary signal of spike or not spike, and that's the sort of information that we started with. Thanks. So um, I'm in charge to uh, remind few of the uh, theoretical aspect and tools we're going to use. So I try to catch up your attention. So uh, we're going to use like information theory uh, tools. And uh, basically to uh, remind you um, some of the things that you should know actually, but um, there is this uh, entropy that we say uh, proportional to the logarithm of uh, distribution, uh, which supp supposedly quantified uh, how much unknown uh, the um, distribution carries. So we can compute the mean like this, and um, here is the mutual information that is related to uh, the uh, entropy. So the idea is that, um, can I, yeah. So this is the uh, quantity of unknown that the uh, random variable x carries, and this is the unknowns that um, knowing y, sorry, so once you know why, there is still some unknown into the uh, um, uh, variable x, and this is the remaining unknown. So at the end, what do we get? We, we get how much unknown, knowing why, how much, do, how much do we remove of unknown knowing why? Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> not obvious. Another interpretation of that is looking at the uh, Kullback-Leiber divergence, um, and actually 
this supposedly quantify the uh, distance between two distribution. So one is uh, the uh, joint um, uh, distribution and the product of the two uh, other distributions. So uh, if the two variables are actually not related uh, one with each other, those two uh, distribution are equal and the distance end up being zero. So this is for the uh, uh, interpretation, but um, formally what we're going to use, so this is the, um, the exact uh, computation of the mutual information between uh, two variables knowing their joint probability and their uh, um, normal probability. Um, and we're going to compare this result uh, with another, yeah, another formula that you should know, which is the Brenner formula, in which we, uh, it's pretty much the same kind of, uh, dis of uh, equation because there is still this p log p inside, but now we integrate over the time. And one of the main uh, assumptions of this formula is that um, sort of we probe all the uh, uh, possible stimulus during our experiments, and uh, we're going to try to evaluate this assumption over the uh, rest of the uh, uh, project. Okay, so the first thing that we had to do was define what the stimulus is that we're going to actually use from this video. So this is like the background of the video, it's pretty blurry, you know, it has a bunch of leaves and rocks and stuff like that, none of which we think we're interested in, we're more interested in the fish that come in and out. So the first thing that we wanted to do was track individual features of the fish. Uh, so we took the eye, for example, it's one of the more kind of like specific features, one of the ones that should in principle be easier to track rather than the full body of the fish or something like that. And we were initially using a machine learning tool called Deep Lab Cut to do this, uh, where you train it up by marking where the eye is. And in frames like this, where the fish are quite different and distinct, this works quite well. It doesn't work very well in frames like this, where you have lots of fish, you don't know which fish is which because they've come in and out of the frame, you're not sure if the eye is particularly clear or not, and so what we did instead was just manually tracked all of the eyes of all of the fish in all of the frames, which <laughs> took a while, but you know, it worked. <laughs> Uh, so to get that into then like a 1D kind of stimulus, we basically took the X, Y coordinates of each of the eyes, uh, translated it into a radial coordinate from the center of the screen, and then for the stimulus, we kind of wanted it to be continuous, like as one fish leaves and another comes in. So at each frame, we took the eye that was closest to the center of the screen as our R value. Okay, and uh, uh, okay, and here is the spiking data you can observe from uh, you can observe from the spiking of the neuron, and uh, you can see uh, the the density of the spiking data sometimes is very sparse, sometimes it's very density, but however in video it's really high dimensional. It's like one one hundred twenty multiplied two hundred dimension. It's really high high dimension. So we want to get some useful feature from this video and uh, to correspond to the spiking of the data in order to calculate the mutual information. Or oh, it's impossible to do it. So what we do, if you watch some BBC movies about uh, uh, the animal world, you can know that uh, like uh, the frog or snake, they can only see some moving object. So that means if the moving object that like means lead neural spiking, they are always corresponding. There are some moving objects in the movie. So you can see from the frame of it, here like no fish, so there are no spiking. But here, if there are fish come in, the neural start to, uh, the uh, start to spike, and then the fish move out the, fr uh, move out the frame, they no longer spiking. So the moving object is a very good feature of the video. So we want to get uh, the video about uh, the moving object to get a feature. So uh, to detect moving pixel, it's very easy. You just take one frame, minus the next frame, and you can see the moving thing. And uh, then you can sum all the moving pixels together and compare with the spiking data. But here there's some trouble. You can see here is the sum of all the moving pixels and uh, you can see that uh, the signal-noise ratio is very small. What's the reason? The reason is you, 
directing manners one next frame like a lot of background noise and uh, you would like to filter the noise in the background. The way we did it, the bad way we try is about a convolution medium filter. It's just uh, use the kernel uh, to filter the data and only take the median value. And you can see that uh, the noise in the background, they vanish. And then we can compare with uh, the, the new feature and you can see here is, is uh, the data get from filter, filter frame and you can see that here there is no uh, the the uh, the signal is very low, and here there's no fish. But when it's fragmenting, it's corresponding there are some spiking data there. Okay, so I am going to start explaining the result we have obtained from the data. So here you can see the heat map. This is all the neurons we have, and this is the time. So especially I want to focus in uh, neuron, I think, 66, yes? And you can see some squares that are darker than, than the rest. This is because if we represent the number of neural spike in versus time, we have uh, higher values. And uh, what we have done is quantify the amount of infor information of a random variable signal. So this is the Brenner formula Hugo has shown about mutual information uh, with the input uh, stimulus and a spike in response. Uh, this mutual information is measured in bytes per spike and we have uh, used this formula. So the result it has been uh, this, this picture, this is the mutual information versus the neurons. And you can see uh, here different, so this is the maximum we, uh, we can find, and this is the minimum. And it represents this, this is the neuron 10, the maximum, and the neuron 22, the minimum mutual information. We can see the difference between the, the, the data. So, well. Uh, Carolina was talking about the Brenner formula, but we want also to take into account the, the mutual information by definition between the stimulus and the response. So we have to just pick uh, a stimulus. We, we try with, with three stimulus. Uh, I know. What, great. Here in red is the sum of moving pixels, the raw signal, directly raw signal. In blue we have the signal of the sum of moving pixels, but filtered. And the last one is the closest fish eye uh, position from the center of the screen. So we can calculate the mutual information between these messages, this stimulus, and the, the spike in response on the, of the salamander brain. So, this is the mutual information per spike for the first stimulus, the raw signal. This is the dark, dark red curve, represent that mutual information, and the light one represents a control. We just scramble the, the response, so we just are losing all the time correlation between the stimulus and the response, and even for this I uh, know this this simple feature. We can say we can say that the mutual information per per spike for each neuron is higher than the control. Well, <laughs> okay, going fast. <laughs> well, if we if we take into account the filter signal, think is better. So now <laughs> now now evidently we have a higher mutual information per spike. And um, if we consider the last uh, the last stimulus, the the, the closest fish eye, the mutual information per spike per neuron is more or less the same than for the sum of moving pixels uh, for the filter signal. But if you if you look at the control, this light green curve is lower than the blue um, light curve. So we can say that for this analysis, the closest fish eye to the center of the screen seems to be the more accurate uh, feature we just make up from the video. So well, the other thing we can do is say, OK, let's compare these results to the Brenner formula once. So we can plot the mutual information um, obtain with the Brenner formula and the mutual information for uh, any each feature. You have here the three plots. Uh, here each dot is one neuron. Um, both of them are in bits per spike. So, well, for the sum of moving pixels, both the raw signal and the filter signal, there we, we don't found a correlation, but for the closest fish eye, it seems to be at least a higher correlation in this case, uh, at least for the correlation coefficient. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I will be very fast. Um, we also try to cluster, does it work? Yes. Uh, we also try to cluster neurons, so we were asking, does it exist family of neurons who uh, respond in a similar fashion, and how does the mutual information behave within these families of neurons? So the first thing we did was trying to find families of neurons. And to do this, what we 
what we classify is the uh, correlation, cross correlation between the uh, spiking rates of neurons. So where we have a high correlation, which is a uh, dark red there, and for very uh, uncorrelated signals, it's um, lighter on, on this correlation matrix. So we will have this uh, correlation matrix and we just set a threshold in order to have cluster of families of neurons and compute the mutual information between these families to see if there is maybe some family that carries more information than others and which families combines better uh, for the mutual information. But as happens often, uh, often in science, uh, our results were not very promising, so we decided to not uh, present it to you. And um, yeah, it was very, very noisy and uh, we couldn't actually get nothing for this. So we just, uh, maybe we skip the conclusion due to the lack of time. And we just want to thank you for your attention. And thanks, Stephanie. So you mean to find different cluster, so find different cluster which maximize the middle information, something like that? Well, like for every two neurons, instead of computing their correlation, you compute their mutual endings, and then you use the results of that to identify um, clusters. So the idea was, I mean, what, what we did was uh, compute the mutual information within clusters. So we take the response within the cluster and comp we have to give a signal. So we still keep the, uh, the distance uh, from the center with the highs. This was our message and compute the response with um, maybe two or three neurons within a cluster. And then we take the same signals and we take neurons from this uh, belonging to different cluster and see if the mutual information changed there. But we couldn't see any, any promising result. Was this your question? Okay, good. Uh, we think so, and uh, <laughs> uh, at least what I do remember, what I do remember is that the, the so we take the center there of these uh, fishy images, well, yeah, but we know that actually it is not pointing on the center, it's pointing somewhere there, but we didn't know exactly where actually the, the high is, so the, the, the high is pointing, so we know that it's not actually in the center, so it's not focused on the center. We, we don't know if, if each, each neuron is watching all the videos. Oh, yeah, we don't know if you see also the boundary and so on, but yeah, it's the example. Yeah, if you could yeah. try reconstructing the image from the, you know, from different ideas about what the neurons are, are responding to in different points and see how that Yeah, we kind of had some missing information about the way that the, <laughs> we're maybe missing a bit of information that would have been useful for that, about like where exactly the neurons spatially were able to record it. But in theory, yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, completely. <laughs> this is completely true. So, I don't know. So the question was, uh, probably the depth away from the actual salamander of the object matters for the, his response to the signal, uh, but with only input, with Im input only to one eye, you, you do lose the depth information. I think though the problem with that is that this is the response in the retina rather than like the actual response of the salamander. And so to some extent like having two eyes, yes, you get like a depth perception, but each retina individually won't have the depth perception then. Hello everyone.
Uh, we are group seven and we are going to introduce you uh, the sublinear entropy production in measurement process with adaptive precision. So we are going to use uh, tools from uh, stochastic thermodynamics like Andrew Mugler uh, presented this, this morning to analyze uh, learning. So learning is about uh, uh, knowing like extra extracting models uh, from sensory data. So you have an organism that can be a cell, an agent uh, that wants to learn uh, a parameter from a noise environment, for, for, for example the concentration of a chemical or uh, a stimuli. So you have like the two main uh, biological process of interest are like cell sensing, uh, the, the object that we will uh, talk about in this presentation, and uh, neural networks. So our model uh, il is built mostly from uh, the article of Meta of 2012. So you have a cell and the cell wants to uh, know the average concentration of a certain chemical in the medium. So, and this, uh, this chemical is uh, like, knows like a, a cycle process, but uh, this computation costs energy. So our goal is to build a model and uh, to find parameters that can uh, decrease uh, this computation of uh, energy. So one of the main results that has been found in the past is that the average, like the, the entropy produ production uh, due to the learning is of the order of uh, LNT. So uh, all the previous uh, description um, uh, belongs to the past and now the new idea that we try to stress out in this uh, work is that uh, instead of performing uh, a cycle of encoding and erasing information we approach the learning procedure of the cell as an adaptive precision process, which means that uh, at its time step, we improve the precision of the measurement, uh, updating the value of the average of the previous observations. So, uh, let's suppose that the cell starts from an equilibrium uh, state, which is de uh, described by this uh, Gaussian uh, distribution, with a, mu, uh, with, uh, a mean mu1 depending on time and, an aver and uh, a variance s1 depending on time. So the cell is interacting with the, an external signal, which has the form of a telegraphic uh, series. And then after the interaction, it gets out of equilibrium and it relaxes again to a new equilibrium state, which is a, a Gaussian with a new uh, mean and a new uh, variance. So uh, for a meaningful learning procedure, we need uh, a variance that should decrease with time in order to have uh, better precision in the measurement. Okay, but as everything in life, learning costs. So what is the most efficient way to learn? In order to answer this question, uh, we take advantage of the fact that uh, the relaxation time of uh, the cell is way greater than the time that we need to record the information. So that means that we can approximate adiabatically the transition between two equilibrium states. And the process is as described here in this uh, diagram. So at its time step, uh, the cell starts from uh, equilibrium distribution. Uh, it interacts with uh, the external signal and then it saturates adiabatically in a new equilibrium state. But uh, as we promised, we try to uh, understand the dissipation profile. So now uh, we want to know how much is the total dissipation from the initial uh, state to the final state. And uh, using the adiabatic uh, approximation, instead of just calculating the difference, uh, the entropy production difference between the initial and the final state, what we do is like we uh, integrate, we sum all the infinitesimal entropy productions between uh, uh, all the in-between uh, equilibrium states. So the take-home message is go adiabatically because uh, you dissipate less. Um, so um, the task that we are going to um, try to do is uh, estimate 
the external concentration of some substance, um, A0, uh, by um, determining the fraction of time that a, a receptor is bound. Um, so we can model the binding process as a telegraph process. So um, um, if we um, integrate all the steps of this process, we should be able to um, uh, estimate a knot, which is the concentration. So um, just because this is a, a sum um, of ones and zeros, you expect that the, it will equal a naught times the total number of steps plus some um, uh, noise, which um, comes from the randomness of the process. So the goal is to convert a naught into the steady state concentration of some intercellular protein Y or um, pro uh, substance. So um, if we measure over time T, we could implement um, this the following scheme. Um, which in principle could dissipate a lot of energy because uh, you're going from an unknown distribution of Y to a very narrow distribution throughout the measurement time. Um, oh, uh, sorry, it's not. Oh, oh okay. So uh, an alternative way to implement this is instead of to degrade Y at a constant time, we can degrade it at a rate that depends on the total time that has passed. And uh, we can write this process as a Langevin equation, uh, as seen uh, up here. Um, we can integrate this equation because the noise um, in Y is additive to get the following solution. And um, at long times, we could evaluate the, in the integrals by expanding them about the endpoints and calculate the first two moments of the distribution of the concentration of Y, um, which you can see has the following form. So um, at long times, uh, the mean of the distribution will roughly remain pinned at a point, um, modulo some noise in the concentration of A. Um, however, the variance is proportional to 1 over the time. So this is um, the component of our measurement, which is called adaptive precision. Um, so as we can see from the movie, what happens is initially the distribution has a mean that is uncertain and becomes more precise. Uh, over time, and once it settles in a given location, then the distribution starts to narrow as we become more certain. And so this way we avoid uh, dissipating uh, energy when we're uncertain of the measurement. Okay, so during the, uh, its time evolution, the system is trying to acquire information to estimate the parameter of the model. And, but it costs uh, energy, it costs dissipation. So uh, we try to analyze, to compute the dissipation, looking at the difference in time of the probability distribution that changes in time because the mean value and the uh, variance is changing in time. So we did so uh, through the KL divergence, which is just a measure of the difference, uh, the relative entry between two probability distributions. And the first case that we analyze is when in the process we have a um, telegraph signal that is just a constant uh, times t, so just a fraction of time, and that the degradation rate is al also uh, linear in time. In this case, if we do a direct collapse of the probability distribution between the uh, initial, initial time t equal to zero and the final time, we observe that the rate of dissipation is linear in time. We compute the same thing by doing the adiabatic process, so moving the probability distribution in time step dt. And for long times, we see uh, also from the, uh, our simulation that the variance uh, grows linearly in time, uh, decreases linearly uh, like 1 over t. So uh, the uh, entropy production in the adiabatic case is the integrate of this uh, quantity, it depends on the, on the variance, and the final result is that this entry production in the adiabatic case scales like just the logarithm of t. So it's a non-trivial result and it means that in the adiabatic case, as we, uh, we, we were thinking, the dissipation is much less than the other case. We also uh, take into account the, uh, a fluctuating telegraph signal where the mean value is a not times t and also the variance because it's just a counting process. And in this case, we, uh, we can have two uh, different cases starting from the time t going to time t plus 1. So the signal can uh, update to time t plus 1 or not. But even in this case, if we average on the distribution of the noise of the, of the telegraph signal, we obtain always an uh, entropy uh, production that is log of t. 
So up to now, we have, we have proved that if we have this kind of system which, which uh, degradation, time, with degradation rate grows with time, we, we can do this measurement without producing too much entropy. However, the production of entropy may be hidden in the process of counting time. So the idea is that we, the idea is to su substitute the, the variable b, which is this counter, with the stochastic process, which means grows with time like t, and which has a certain invariance. So this process plays the role of a timer. <laughs> Since the timer is not measuring the time with infinite precision, the hope is that it will not produce too much entropy. Indeed, in fact, if the timer were infinitely precise, the amount of entropy produced will be infinite. So we have, uh, we have done the same calculation of before using this new variable. And what we have found is that the alpha is the exponent which rules the variance of this timer. And we found that alpha play, plays a key role in the, in the process. If alpha is bigger than 1, which means if the timer is very noisy, the variance of the distribution will go to infinity, and we will not be able to do, to do this measurement. If alpha is less than 1, we are happy because the variance goes to 0 with an exponent which is smaller than 1. And if alpha is equal to 1, the, the noise is such that the, the probability distribution will be, uh, there will be an equilibrium in the probability distribution and, and the system will relax to this the distribution. So we have done simple uh, Langevin simulation to show a result. We missed the labels. This is the case alpha equal to zero and we can see that the variance goes to a, a fixed value. And this is the case of alpha 0.7. We can see that the, the simulation is in agreement with the theoretical prediction. And we have computed also the production of entropy in this case, and we found that the production of entropy is almost the same with a factor in front of it, and we see that it's smaller than the previous case, and this is because since the process is not deterministic, the entropy production will be, will be smaller, and the case alpha is equal to 1 will be mar the, the production of entropy, the leading contribution will not be the log, the log 1, but another one, and we didn't compute it. So now we have to show a dynamic skin which can implement such a process we call B. Okay. So just one or two moments. Uh, okay. So our next task is to find a noise timer. Here we provide a model for a noise timer. But for this one, uh, we haven't got time to uh, express it, right, explore, explore this idea. So I will just give you some, some idea like how, how, we, how we are going to going to do. Uh, so there's two chemicals here. Two we can treat this as two chemicals in the bio body and uh, their reaction uh, uh, based two raw and their reaction is also uh, re also follows a uh, reaction and diffusion equation. So the density of these two chemicals may be an indicator of time, indicator of time and uh, other mechanisms may also be possible. Um, for example, the periodical fluctuation uh, of chemical density um, sensed by the cell, which uh, links to Andrew's uh, lectures uh, these days. So that's for the noise timer. Here's a brief summary. So in our, in our project, there's in total two systems. One is uh, the timer and one is the updater. For the updater, um, for, for the updater, it uh, obeys such an updating rule and uh, the, the density of the, the density is, which is why we well, increase increase in precision as as t go t goes too large, and we have explicitly explicitly showed uh, in previous slides that um, when t go, goes large, the dissipated entropy entropy rate will be one over t, which if you take the integral will be logarithm, and for the timer we want the timer to have uh, to have. Uh, dissipation rates uh, sublinear in time so that the total entropy production will be uh, entropy of the timer plus log t which is uh, entropy by the pro updater over t and the system will go to zero as t goes to very large while the, uh, while the accuracy of measurement keeps increasing so that uh, we are learning the, learning the uh, density y uh, with zero energy entropy dissipation Okay, so three possible ways to explore why is, uh, what's the explicit mechanism for the timer and what's the interaction between timer and updater and uh, uh, what memory storage may also be a problem. Uh, yeah, so that's it. So 
if I understood correctly, you said that when you added noise to the timer, the entropy production decreased. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain that again? I missed why. So the, 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 first, the first thing says that we do the, the calculation, so it, it is what we have found, what we found. And all at the first point, we found the res result quite astonishing, but it's quite intuitive because if you, have, you are moving in a deterministic way, it is re reasonable that the entropy reduction will be gr bigger than if you move slowly. Since, since the, variance, the variance goes to zero slow in a slower, in a sl uh, slowly, respect to the case alpha equal to zero, we expect that the, the reduction of entropy will be uh, smaller since the, 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 the system is relaxing slower than in the previous case. This makes sense or not at all? <laughs> yeah. Can you repeat? I so didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the timer is not slower. It's o only noisy, so the 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 accuracy, the accuracy of the timer is is bigger. Is more more. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, well, the updater, if um, the process is less controlled, and so usually to control a process, you, know, you need more entry production, but we don't have a mechanism for the timer yet, so um, once we do find a timer, um, that will definitely, I mean, if it's an active part of the system, that will also introduce entropy production from the timer. Yeah, you said you don't have a mechanism for the timer. What about just a birth process? I mean, that's naive. Why is that not the best? Um, well, we, we just need to confirm that it's the best mechanism. Yeah, the idea was the it was to use a bird-like bird process, but we didn't have time to, to, to do it. Because we need to have the mean value that scales with time and the variance also that satisfies our request. So we didn't find the a process with this feature. So. Yep. To be? Yeah, the, the mean value of the process has to scale linearly with time. And in order to have a good result in the measurement, the variance of this process should grow with, an, with time with, ex with an exponent which is less than 1. So these are the, the requirements. Hello everyone, we are Project 4. We are working on a numerical analysis of bottlenecks in behavior. Uh, we're going to start with the motivation of this project. Uh, we started with a paper that involved Professor Berman, uh, where they, they, they saw that across, the, across, across animals in the animal kingdom, you can see a structure that is uh, a bigger bundle of neurons, usually the brain, and it's connected to the peripheral nerves. They're more sparsely uh, distributed, and they're connected by two types of processes, ascending neurons, which are the ones that take the sensory that you get in the peripheral nerves to your brain, 
and the descending neurons that we are very interested in in this project, which are the ones that take the, be the behaviors, the decisions that you make in your brain, and carry them out to sensory and motor systems. Uh, we can see in this little schematic from uh, uh, Anmo Kim, of 2007, the scaling between the central brain of the fruit fly, the descending neurons, and the thoracic ganglion, where you can find the motor and, sens and sensor neurons. Uh, we, because we're physicists, a few number for you guys. Uh, in the central brain, it has about 135,000 neurons, and the descending neurons are of the order of two, two, 250 and 500 pi pairs of neurons. Uh, in the paper of Kent et uh, al. that I talked about 2018 from Professor Gordon, they found that descending, neur descending neurons are responsible for stereotyped uh, movements like uh, flying, walking, singing, as he says. Uh, they also found that multiple descending neurons are responsible for similar behaviors. So for example, when they're grooming their antennas and eyes, and when they are uh, extending the, uh, their sort of beak to eat. Yes, <laughs> that was fast. I don't know how to say that word, sorry. Uh, they, they use the same area in the descending neurons, the same group of neurons. And also they have found that be the behaviors are often dependent on the prior behavior state, but this uh, part we could not model. Uh, in the same paper from Kim in 2017, they worked with vision in uh, fruit flies, and they I, I saw this little picture which resembles a neural networks network, and that's what we are going to use to model this type of process. Uh, also, co uh, comparing the numbers, you can see that the brain has a lot more neurons than the, the spinal cord or the process that takes these behaviors to the sensory and motor neurons. That's why we decided to use, uh, we, Professor Gordon, decided to use the bottleneck, uh, a bottleneck ne neural system. Okay, so this is the basic structure of our neural network. We have an input layer which uh, assigns tasks. All the inputs are binary strings, mm, and each task is associated with one binary string. Then we have a hidden layer which corresponds to the descending neurons, and then we have an output layer which corresponds to motor, motor neurons. Also, there's one binary string associated with each of these outputs, but we generated them randomly and we made sure that there was a unique one-to-one -one mapping from the tasks to the output. Um, since we want to look at a bottleneck, uh, the sizes of the input and the output layer are much larger than this bottleneck layer. Uh, we made two simplifying assumptions when we did this, which need to be changed later on. One is that for now we are assuming that n equals m. And the second thing that we had to come up with the scheme for the number of units that would get activated in this output layer. And for now we are using 50%, but biologically this is too high and needs to be a bit more sparse. Okay, so the central question here is, you see this neural network, and you see that uh, uh, it uh, what would happen if this hidden layer, this middle layer with the dimension R, is smaller than your input layer? So then you can see that as information transfers from the first layer to the next, there is an uh, information loss. So the first thing we tried to do was, we, using this neural network, we trained it for different numbers of inputs N and for different uh, sizes of the hidden layer R. Uh, so there are several things to point out. So here. Uh, we show um, the curves of the learning error, which in this case of our neural network, we use the mean squared error. And uh, the first thing is to note is that um, the x-axis is the hidden layer size. And you can see that when the hidden layer is small, the loss or the learning error is high. And that means the neural network has trouble learning. Uh, whereas uh, when uh, the hidden layer size is the same size as the input layer, then the neural network learns perfectly. You have a learning error of zero. 
Okay, so, um, and the other thing you can notice is that these different curves correspond to different uh, input layer size, and input layer size is another uh, way to say the number of behaviors that we're asking the neural network to learn. And so here you can see that for larger size, um, this, uh, the neural network finds it harder to learn uh, when we are trying to stuff it with more behaviors. So the next thing we want to do is that given our learning error, we want to translate it to a notion of learning capacity. And to do this, uh, to do this, what we require is uh, given is compare our um, the output signal generated by our training neural network, compare it with uh, the signal that we actually trained it with, and we look for exact matching of the sequence. And if there's even one neuron that doesn't match, we say that the neural network has has not learned this behavior. And doing this, we can plot uh, the learning capacity, um, again, as a function of the hidden layer size for different values of n. And here you can see, again, it's uh, consistent uh, conceptually with the previous plot. Uh, when you have small hidden layer size, the network doesn't learn a single behavior. Uh, but when you have a hidden layer size equal to the input layer, the network can almost learn all of the behaviors. So now what we want to do, you see that there's a transition between these two regimes uh, where your network becomes capable of learning the behaviors. And so what we do is we, care, um, we fit these data with a sigmoid to try to extract the centers. It's a little faint, but you can kind of see these vertical lines to extract the centers of these transitions for these curves corresponding to different n. And what we find is uh, that there is a power law dependence, at least in this regime of n, um, for the, uh, the critical hidden layer size, which is the uh, hidden layer size at which the network starts to learn a non-zero number of behaviors. Um, and you can see here, so this is a, the big plot is a log-log plot, and you can see it's very robustly linear. Um, uh, and the power exponent is uh, around uh, three halves. And uh, one more thing to note is that, uh, you know, this power exponent is larger than one. And for uh, the ends that we looked at, R is still, RC is still uh, smaller than N, but you can imagine that as M becomes larger, you would eventually require uh, R a C to be larger than N, which means that your system, your neural network will never learn any behavior. Um, but that doesn't sound too physical, so what we think is the more likely scenario is that there are different regimes depending on how large n is, and the scaling would differ in those regimes. Okay, so the next thing that we wanted to look at was context dependency. So how do, do the hidden inner neurons affect the outputs that are seen? And to do this, we start off with our trained neural net and we force one of the hidden units at a time to become activated and then see how this changes the output layers. Doing this, we can generate heat maps like this, where this is for the outputs, the change in the outputs when one hidden neuron was activated. So on the rows correspond to uh, each behaviors and the columns correspond to different motor units corresponding to these behaviors. Uh, the color coding is as follows, so the white and the gray uh, color corresponds to the motor units that were completely unaffected when the hidden neuron was activated, whereas the yellow and the red ones correspond to those that did get affected. You can see some sort of clustering in the sense that for each behavior, only a specific numbers of motor units seem to be affected by this activation. At this point, we don't see any clustering of behaviors, and this is because, as I said before, the outputs were that we generated were completely random. Uh, Veronica, after me, would discuss this more realistic case where we start seeing clustering of behaviors. But even here, we have some information because this heat map corresponds to just one example of activating a hidden neuron, but you could do it for all of them in our network, and you get similar plots. And doing this, you could come up with some sort of average statistics for the behaviors. And these are just two example things that you might want to look at. The first one is uh, exactly how much does each behavior get affected by changing your hidden layer. And you can do this by computing the Hamming distance between the original outputs and the new ones. Or you can conversely look at how robust is uh, each behavior to the hidden, uh, hidden layer. And you can do this. And you can see that basically you have a a range of behaviors that are more robust 
than the others. So to okay to move on to a more realistic case, uh, here we simulated uh, our behaviors in a way that we are going to have like three distinct types of behaviors, and we have an obvious uh, modular structure of this matrix. Um, and uh, at first we looked at the network that uh, is not undergoing any bottleneck, so it managed to learn our behaviors perfectly. Uh, and moreover, it turned out to be really robust because when we are affecting just one uh, single hidden ne neuron, it doesn't really change much, as you can see on the left plot. But uh, when you start to affect pairs of neurons, this is where you start noticing this uh, uh, kind of conditional dependence because you can see that, like, for example, here, two neurons uh, ended up to be responsible for the shift from behavior of type 1 to behaviors of type 2. Uh, in the bottleneck, this picture is even more pronounced because you kind of force your network to condense the information um, in a very small um, uh, latent space. So uh, we actually can see that even single neuron can already distinct like behavior of, of type 1 and behavior of type 2. Uh, and when we are affecting couples of neurons, uh, it actually kind of, you can see that there is some synergy between them. And uh, to sum up, uh, this is just the beginning and there is definitely a lot more to explore with even this very simple architecture. For example, we're going to look at the more sparse uh, behavior matrices and uh, look uh, whether this um, uh, unequal sizes of input and output uh, neurons will affect our scalings. We also would like to uh, think more about uh, any sort of analytical arguments for those scalings and probably um, make some predictions for the real life uh, neural systems. And um, we definitely <laughs> had a lot of fun uh, thinking about this project and uh, we would like to thank professors Ilya and Gordon for helpful discussions during those weeks. So when I said the network has no capacity of learning, I was referring to, in particular, um, this plot right here. So you can see that, uh, you know, here, this, this says the fraction of behaviors that the network has learned. So if it has learned no behaviors, then it has n zero learning capacity. That's You're saying, like, like theoretically, it should be able to do that. Yeah, like there's some way to, uh, like, to map one, say, a few, a subset, a small subset of tasks to some motor activities. Uh, Gordon. This, I think part of it is due to the cost function you chose, because you're doing the means, the, you're doing the, uh, the mean squared error, and so it's just a matter of, like, you were trying to get most, the way, I think your results might be a little bit different if you would have instead tried to get, like, right now you're trying to get most of them okay, because you're doing mean squared error. If you then had a cost function which was a little closer to how many did I get right, you can't exactly do that, because that would be hard to train. Mm -hmm. But if you had something which was more related to, like, really making sure that I got a few right and most of them wrong, then you would probably get pretty different curves, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. Um, going on the same thing, uh, uh, sorry, uh, does it, this curve change at all as a uh, function of training time, or is this very robust to training time? So we've, we've really tried to optimize th this finalized curve. This curve has changed many times. Um, <laughs> as <laughs> we've ran this measurement many times to try to make sure. Uh, what we're aiming for is for um, 
uh, to achieve optimal learning. So when, when we look at a learning curve, uh, we really, like, for long periods of time, the loss doesn't change, then we say, okay, we hope that this really means that the network has learned all that it can. And we, yeah, if you have, like, suggestions for um, <laughs> how to even more robustly determine this, it's, they're very welcome. <laughs> I guess I just I just missed. Um, so n is the number of uh, units in the input layer, and r is the number of units. And then, are you also scaling the number of tasks? So the number of tasks in our case is always equal to the number oh, of. Oh, it's equal. And so mm -hmm. this is kind of a, an abstraction of like task assignment. It's kind of okay. yeah. But the number of possible sequences scales a lot more. So like. Yeah. So we went. Yeah, so we randomly generate n of them every time, but we we do it like ten times to ab like uh, multiple times to average over the possible random sequences. Yeah. Time for one more question. Burning question. Okay, let's switch to the next one. Yeah, big spoilers. Okay, we have to start? Okay, I will start. Well, hello everybody. Uh, our project is about zebra finches, these uh, cool little birds. And, well, they are very interesting because uh, little birds learn to sing from their fathers. So they push hard trying to mimic the song their father uh, is singing. And at first they fail, but after a while they can reach and uh, perform the target song. And this is very interesting to scientists because somehow uh, is similar to the mm, behavior in learning that humans have. And for the birds it's very important to learn how to sing because this is their mainly strategy to seduce females' birds. <laughs> and yeah, I know that many of you also found the right song in these weeks. <laughs> um, well, this is a, a sketch of the bird's brain with the part we are interested in. And let's see them in the details. Like the operative center is called array and it's like a logistic center. It receives outputs and it emits, it receives inputs and emits outputs. And yeah, we have like a red and a blue input. We don't enter in details. And what array does, it, it fires on these motors. In uh, our model, there are two motors. One regulates the amplitude and the other one regulates the frequency. And so like the combination of these uh, uh, two motors produce the song. From the biological sketch uh, to a more computational sketch, and let's see in uh, more details, you see that in array arrives contemporary a red and a blue signal and that time the array produces an output to the motors and so the song is produced and this song is evaluated by a critic and this critic compares the song produced by the bird to the target song and as every critic it judges, it can approve it and then the connection, the links between array and the motors are reinforced. Or sometimes it can not approve it. And that time the connection are penalized. Okay, this one uh, was like the model we found in the literature, in Duffy and Fit articles. Uh, now Ali is going to introduce our own model. Uh, okay. So this is the model that we are using for our project. Uh, it's a little simpler than the one that we talked about earlier. So we have uh, four RA neuron inputs. 
um, and those go to two motor outputs, and we add noise to the system in between the RA and the motors. Uh, and so this is what some sample spikes would look like. And we can go from the input spikes to the motor outputs using numerical, numerical integration. And we can compare the motor outputs that we get to the, uh, to the target motor uh, using an error function here. Um, and then we can provide feedback using this error function back to the RA inputs for the next round. Uh, and so this is what some sample inputs and outputs would look like. So this is using 20 RA neurons and two motors you have this input spike train, and then you can see that the uh, spikes move when we add noise, and then this is what the two outputs would look like. Um, and so this is, once we got the, this process working, we wanted to look at how they actually compare uh, their, well, how they actually uh, go from the input song to the target song. And so in the paper that Nicola was talking about earlier, they used reinforcement learning, and we wanted to compare uh, different kinds of learning so we looked at gradient descent, which randomly perturbs the system and keeps positive changes. And then we also looked at infotaxis, where we can switch configurations to maximize the information. Um, so for, I guess I just need one slide. Yeah, so for gradient descent, what we essentially did is we, um, actually for both of them, we came up with a template. And the point is that the bird is eventually supposed to get to the spike train that produces the motor output templates. Um, but you start off with an arbitrary signal. So we have eight time bins, um, which can be occupied by four spikes. And for example, if you start off with, oh, cool. If you start off with x at x at one, two, six, and eight, um, we have a nearest neighbor algorithm wherein you essentially, at each iteration, pick one of these spikes and move it by one bin. Um, and so in this case, if you were to pick spike two, you could move it to three or one. Um, we obviously choose it to move to three because there's already something at one. Then you, comp you compute the loss with respect to the template uh, song. And based on if the error is less than the previous loss, um, previous iteration loss, you keep the change that you've made, which essentially is your reinforcement learning, with like um, an, a learning rate of one. Um, and even though this seems random, it eventually there there are a few uh, iterate, after a few iterations, it eventually reaches the template um, motor outputs in the template song. All right, and so we looked at um, two different configuration spaces here. Um, first, on the left, we looked at a situation where the spikes couldn't cross each other. This just means the first spike has to happen before the second, and etc. Um, we did this to like kind of limit our uh, phase space down to about 70 uh, different configurations, and this will become obvious later. Um, and then the second situation we looked at is when they could cross or overlap, so the spikes can, can occur at any of the time bins, and they can happen in at the same time bins. And this gives us kind of two different systems to look at. Um, and so you can kind of imagine like the, the error space here will have some local minimas, and this will be different based off of the different configurations that we're looking at. Um, in the no crossing case, uh, what happens a lot is it can get stuck. You can imagine maybe like this fourth spike, there's an actual spike in this time four, or at the spot four, um, but none of the, s the spikes to the left can move. So if the, the fourth spike tries to move, the error actually increases because there's supposed to be a spike there, um, and so it can get stuck for a long period of time. Um, and the error is relatively high. In the other case, you can imagine minima can occur when the two spikes are in the opposite spot, and the same sort of thing happens. And so what you can do is we, we add an exploration term, which basically says um, the bird's supposed to look around for a period of time before. If it hasn't found anything that's as good as what it was previously, it snaps back. And this will uh, uh, help convert the data in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and we can see this. So if you plot the uh, probability that you'll get the correct uh, song as a function of iterations for various values of e, which is our exploration time, you can kind of see what happens. Um, in the no crossing limit, if you don't explore, or if you explore too long, you'll end up getting stuck longer and it takes a lot longer to converge. Um, but it usually converges around like 30 iterations. And then in the uh, crossings case, uh, you can look at something else. You can look at if you don't explore too much, if you're just trying to exploit, you get stuck in these local minima for a long period of time. Um, and you'll get something like this. So the second method we looked at is infotaxis, which was proposed by Massimo Vargasola, who's in the room. Um, and the idea is that we want to maximize our expected gain of information with every choice of spike train that we try. 
Um, and the way we do that is we focus on the entropy, um, and this is calculated. Uh, so um, x star is the is the correct spike times that we're trying to get, um, and we have a probability distribution for where they could be, which is our expected probability distribution, and we calculate the entropy based on that. Hello. Okay. <laughs> As Nora was saying, uh, at each step, the bird has to compute the expected change in entropy, and for that, it has to use its current information. So, what's the current information that the bird has? It's its own estimate of the probability distribution of the real song, which is the real sequence of spikes, which we call X star. So, it's that P T of X star. So what we assume for this in our model is that at first the bird doesn't know anything about the real song, so it starts with a very uninformative prior that's uniform, and at each step it can update its posterior uh, using a Bayesian rule. For this to be able to work, the bird actually has to... I don't know where the light is here, so... Um, for this to be able to work, the bird has to actually have access to this conditional probability, that's the conditional probability of getting the uh, error output y given that the correct song was x star and the bird sang the song x. So whether the real bird can actually know this is instinctively, it's very questionable, but for the sake of our project we assume that it knows it. And in order to generate it for our model, what we did is we just used, we chose all the possible combinations of x which is the song that the bird is trying, and the X star, which is the target song, and we ran that through our model uh, 500 times for each pair, and w using that we could build our distribution probability of getting an error function Y given the inputs. Okay, so the first way we tried to do this was we used this empirical PDF to uh, do the info taxes policy, which chooses its next step based on where it thinks the entropy will be the smallest. And as a first pass, we restricted it again to only allow nearest neighbor moves. So it can only move one spike at a time and only moves each spike by one bin. And you can see that as it begins, the error is pretty high. It dips down a bit and then it just like flat lines. It basically cannot find the target. But Interestingly, the entropy of the uh, posterior distribution goes to zero very quickly in about five steps. So this, this is kind of a paradox because it seems to know where the target is, but it doesn't go there. So there's a, there's a movie of this. I guess I should probably explain it before I play it. Um, so the red square is what it's trying, and the blue star is where the target is, and it's going to kind of move around as it tries different things. The purple is where it thinks the target is, and the yellow is the expected entropy if it moves to a spot. And since it's nearest neighbor, it can only move to specific spots. So, no, I think it's at the bottom. Yeah. So you can see it jumps around, and right there, you see the, the prior jumped up. It basically converged to a delta function. So basically what's happening is, based on six samples and its knowledge of the empirical PDF, it knew with total certainty where the target was. And I, now as I'm saying this, I realize that this is the wrong movie. Can you go back two slides? <laughs> uh, it, this one, yeah, sorry, that was a spoiler alert. Uh, so this one, it also figures out the posterior very quickly, um, not in six steps, but in like, I don't know, 15. Um, so it's narrowed it down to two spaces. Now it knows it's here, but it's stuck very far away because it can only move by one. Um, so go forward. Um, yeah, I guess I could do that. Uh, <laughs> so we restricted, I mean, we lifted this restriction that it can only move by one and allowed it to jump anywhere. Um, and now the learning is kind of what you'd expect. It basically figures out where it's supposed to go and it goes there almost immediately. So it seems like a very powerful algorithm, uh, but there's kind of a caveat. Uh, I already showed you this, so I won't play it again. Um, so our kind of hypothesis was the reason this was happening was because its knowledge of the prior, which is a very specific probability distribution, gave it a lot of information, right? And so to test this, we compared 
the entropy over time uh, for when it uses an info taxes policy to choose its next input versus the entropy over time if it just randomly picks inputs, looks at outputs, and updates its prior. And this is for a lot more noise in the system, so now it's learning in 50 steps, not five. And we find that the info taxes policy only does slightly better than a completely random policy at letting the bird know where the target is. And the, the kind of thought process is that uh, m like kind of random samples give it just as much information as samples that kind of drive it towards the target. And so I think for this specific system, the info taxes policy doesn't work super well. Although if you do know the empirical PDF, you can learn where the target is very, very efficiently. So in conclusion, we tried two methods of um, finding the target, gradient descent and info taxes. Gradient descent usually found the, found the target, but sometimes it got stuck in local minima for quite a long time. It depended on one parameter that if we chose the right value, it would kind of strike a better balance between exploration and exploitation and, um, and would improve the performance. Info taxes, on the other hand, was much faster at learning where the target was. But that was mostly due to this empirical PDF that Debbie introduced, um, which is a huge amount of data. Um, so that is something that gives it its power. <laughs> so <laughs> the real conclusion is that we've really enjoyed working on this project and learned a lot. So thank you. <laughs> No, I mean to in order. To, so basically, I was thinking if it wanted to find uh, somewhere where it would not be likely to get to, but uh, to get out of a local minimum or stuff like that. Uh, no, okay. It just waits for the noise to kick it out. Okay, understood. And so I guess another point is uh, for such a small system, I guess it makes sense to maybe uh, just do gradient descent and go about doing it. But if you wanted to have a larger system, do you think? Uh, you would need some sort of a structure, some sort of a network in order to train the system, and what sort of system do you think would be good for training it? I mean, I don't know much about training the systems, to be honest, but I, I do think, I think gradient descent will work in larger systems. Um, the reason we haven't done larger systems is it takes a really, really long time to get the empirical PDF, so it wasn't really worth me comparing larger systems on the gradient descent side. Um, I think it would work, I think it would take a really long time, um, but I'm sure you could train it to do better. <laughs> Each one of those uh, plots required 90 billion samples from the PDF that we had to generate in order to run. So thank you, Yale, for letting me use your supercomputer <laughs> for totally unrelated reasons. When, when the birds are learning, in the what do they get wrong? Like, is it like they can't, like when they're trying to learn the song, is it like the, they can't remember the full sequence or they get like the pitch or the time, like what is it? I don't know anything about this, <laughs> but <laughs> but I I guess that the problem is the bird doesn't know his how his own body works yet, so he doesn't know what neural uh, in, uh, output would make each behavior. So it's trying to learn how to manage its own body. Actually, I, I, I can. The assumption clearly is for us that it doesn't know the order outputs, so yeah. we're but not. I mean, the real biology is actually very different depending on which specific bird you deal with, but typically there is a certain period of time where the bird just sits there and listens and just tries to remember what, you know, remember what the father sings. And after that it starts bubbling just like a human baby would, uh, start, and then it starts producing sort of syllables, individual blocks of, of, uh, of song, and then it starts forming each particular syllable and eventually tries to form the specific sequence of those syllables, right? And in different birds, the sequences are different, right? And even the sequences of what they do are different. So. Oh, that last so, so you actually have three models to... Uh, yes. Thank you. So you have three models that tries to um, explain how birds learn to sing. How would you assess which one is closest to the nature? So 
So yeah. what I can say is first man learning because we didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only thing I, I can think about now is what I was saying before. That I don't think it's very likely that the bird actually knows how the, like the probability distribution of getting a value y given what the real song is and given what it sang because it's a super complicated thing to, for the bird to actually instinctively know. So I don't think that model should actually be true, but... Yeah. No, I somehow the starting point of this project was uh, like that in reality uh, birds learn much faster than uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm. I did, we didn't do reinforcement learning al al algorithm, but they did in these two papers we cited earlier. And so the idea was in intro mm, introducing infotaxis instead of uh, instead of a random prior, and uh, so probably the answer is uh, they neither of these three algorithms are good or that good. I think the idea is that the, the actual infotaxis, if it was actually happening, it wouldn't know the exact PDF. It would just use some kind of crude approximation that maybe it could instinctively be born with. Um, and I, I think, you know, if I were if I wanted to work on this, you know, what it, one of the things I would look at is is there some very crude kind of primitive, you know, function that you could replace this PDF with that gets you most of the same power. Um, and I, I don't I don't know if anyone's looked at that. So, thank you. Thanks everyone for the first time.